Let's begin with a, uh, a quick prayer. Father, we praise you and we bless you for the wonderful things you do in the world around us. We ask that you would draw our hearts closer to peace, that we could see peace between people, between nations, and most particularly, we pray for the victims of the war in Ukraine on both sides of the issue. For all of this, we pray to the Lord. Okay. Now, remember, we're describing the uh, exodus out of, uh, uh, it's under the guise of the exodus out of Babylon, but it's actually a reference to the end of time when the Jews will be reunited. He says, you will come out with joy. Uh, this is 5512. You will come out with joy and you will be guided in peace. Um, that this notion of, of coming out in joy and to find the guiding in peace, oftentimes guiding, see they're looking at like herd animals and stuff, guiding oftentimes involves violence to get them to go the right direction, this sort of thing. But he says, you will be guided in peace. Mountains and hills will break into joyful cries before you, and all the trees of the countryside will clap their hands. And the, the reference here is, we talked, I think, before about the ecological nature of Jewish law, about how things are taken care of. So nature itself rejoices at the Jews' return because of the ecology thing. Cypress will grow instead of thorns, myrtle instead of nettles. And both those are issues of plants that need water as distinct from plants that live in the desert. So they're prophesying water for thing. And this will be a memorial for the Lord, an eternal sign that shall not be destroyed. And it's, it's the action that God takes. It, that action is a memorial to God. An example would be in the crucifixion. The memorial to God is the fact that Jesus died for us. That's the memorial. And it's not a, a building or anything like that. It's, it's a fact of history. So, now this is the third part of the book of Isaiah, and I think there are only three parts to the book. I could be wrong, but I think there are only three parts to the book. And uh, the, the, uh, the way the three parts came to be is that after Isaiah died, uh, he had a group of people who followed him called the prophets. They, they're referred to several times in the scriptures. And uh, they would uh, take the teachings of Isaiah and apply them to their contemporary time. And so they're, they're actually these three separate books. The first book of Isaiah is most probably the actual Isaiah prophecies. The second book is where they applied his prophecies at a later time and then the last book is when they applied them at a later time yet but in order for all this to have come from one person he would have had to live for about 300 years so it's uh it it's different people but it's that community but applying his basic principles so thus says the lord make fair judgment your concern Act with justice, for my salvation is near and my righteousness is ready to be revealed. The, you know, the strong thing we find in scripture as far as holiness and everything always has to do with justice. It has to do with this whole idea of social justice. And we, we think of, uh, like for instance, in, in the structure, God sees that you have to establish justice and justice will in turn cause peace. People are at peace with one another if everyone's getting justice. But the big violation of, of uh, justice leads to the lack of peace. You know, like, like people have much more than other people and stuff like this. It's the violations of justice that lead to the breakdown of peace. And then once you get peace, you can actually move to a point where people are really concerned about one another, love one another, you know, and that's the stages that God would want. But we never seem to quite grasp justice. And the, uh, it, it, it's a strange thing that people are much more interested 
in charity than they are in justice. Like they, they will donate money to help people and stuff like this, but it doesn't come down to the, I, I know a number of very wealthy people who give large amounts of money to, uh, like say the, uh, the people's kitchen and, and stuff like that, the large amounts of money to things like that. But it never occurs to them that they could take all their employees and raise everyone's salary by a little bit and that all their employees would be much better off. And that's justice, you know. But they would rather keep the salaries the way they are so they can do charitable. And you watch that in, in big companies like uh, Walmart that's notorious for its salaries. But they're massive gifts they give to different things each year, huge amounts of money. And you find that with most businesses that they, you know, that I'm thinking of the, the ad you see on TV, Bissell, that, you know, it, it saves homeless pets. Well, why don't you just charge less for the vacuums, you know? The, but anyway, so uh, he says, uh, blessed is anyone who does this, anyone who holds fast to it, observing the Sabbath. And this, this idea of justice it is integrated into the whole thing of the Sabbath. Like a, if you have a, a, a business, you have to give your employees the Sabbath off. You have to, you know, and there's, there's equality things that they're all intermeshed with the Sabbath. The Jewish religion as a religion is very, very justice orientated. And I think a big part of that is because historically they have never had justice. And so they're, they're very concerned about this for other people. So he says, not profaning the Sabbath, holding back from every evil deed. And the, the idea is, uh, if you, it, it would be like saying the best thing to give up for Lent would be sin, okay? Just go 40 days without sinning. And the, this idea of, holding back the evil that we do, that sort of thing, that, that that should help to make the Sabbath holy too. He says, no foreigner attached to the Lord may say, the Lord will firmly exclude me from his people. Now, it, it's difficult at times in the scriptures for the Jews to accept that a non-Jew finds salvation. Like if you, if you would talk to Jews today, you you would find the general feeling is that to be a Jew is to be saved, period. To be a Jew is to be saved. Now, as a Gentile, you would need to be what they call a righteous Gentile to be saved, okay? And that they really make this kind of uh, distinction, but a righteous Gentile can be saved, but you have to be the righteous Gentile. As a Jew, you don't even need to be righteous, you know, that you just, are saved. But many Christians hold that too. Like if you're baptized, you're saved. If you aren't baptized, it doesn't matter if you're Mother Teresa, you're going to hell. You know, this whole thing. I remember, um, I remember listening to Jimmy Schwigert one time. I really liked to listen to him. He was a, a, a great preacher. But uh, he was talking one time and he said, if Mother Teresa has not taken Jesus Christ as her personal savior, it doesn't matter the thing she's doing, she's going to hell. I'm thinking, well, that's kind of cute, you know, that uh, Jimmy Schwaggard, Mother Teresa. But anyway, it's just, you know, the, it, it, it's absurd to deal in the judgment of other people. So he says um, that, that no person, no per, if, no foreigner attached to the Lord. And specifically, they would probably think of, like if you, if you are Jewish and have slaves, you would be expected to circumcise your slaves. And your slaves would have the right to be involved with the Passover ceremony and stuff. And they're really integrated into the Jewishness. Um, whether they would see that as applying to, you know, people who weren't enslaved, we don't know, okay? 
But anyway, he says, no eunuch should say, look, I am a dried up tree. And the idea is that the eunuch, of course, can't have children. And for the Jews, everlasting life is connected to children. Like the, your names carried on and all, this is everlasting life for them uh, traditionally. Uh, he says, for the Lord says this, to the eunuchs who observe my Sabbaths and choose to do my good pleasure and hold to my covenant, I will give them in my house and within my walls a monument better than children. So he says, if, if people follow my laws, all this sort of thing, and the eunuch, you know, the temptation is, I have no everlasting life. So why bother with all this observance and that sort of stuff? And he says, you follow this. And he says, I will give you a monument better than sons and daughters. He says, I will give them an everlasting name that will never be effaced. And I, I think this is, is curious because I, the idea of someone being faithful and being a eunuch, I think someone like Francis of Assisi, who wasn't, technically a eunuch, but had no children or anything. And he's probably, Francis of Assisi is probably the most famous religious person in all of history. And you find him very well accepted in all traditions. I, I don't know if you know that that's the principal reason that Francis took the name Francis. Um, that if, uh, if you remember about maybe I don't know how long it's been since John Paul left, but when John Paul was still kind of alert and everything, but he'd been Pope for quite a while, um, he called an international meeting in order to bring about this re mutual respect of religion. There, there's a general persecution in the world against religion, qua religion. So if you're in a Muslim country, it's against Muslims. If you're in a Christian country, it's against Christians. If you're, it's just against religion itself. And so he called the meeting of these, these leaders and uh, he wanted to have it in Rome, but uh, the Jews were uncomfortable in having it in Rome. So they argued back and forth about different places where it should be and stuff like this. The, uh, the Muslims did not want to hold it in Jerusalem because they didn't like the idea that Jerusalem was being held by the Jews. And, but anyway, it went back and forth and back and forth. And the city they agreed on was Assisi. The meeting actually was held in Assisi. And when you study things like um, uh, Francis, according to a legend, and it could be true, we don't really know, Francis traveled to the Holy Land during the Crusades. And he got in to see the Sultan, I think it was Saladin the Magnificent. And Francis wanted to proclaim the gospel to him so he could convert him and get those. So Saladin saw him, and I think he did his preaching, whatever it was. And, uh, and he was uh, dismissed after it was over. But it's interesting, no harm came to Francis. And probably, I'm guessing it's because they thought he was crazy because going into that situation during the Crusades, the fact he wasn't killed was amazing. But Francis, and we do know this is true, opened up hospitals uh, during the Crusades, and the condition was the hospital would treat both, friend, both the Crusaders and the Muslims. And if you go into the Holy Land today, you'll find that almost all the Catholic churches are run by Franciscans because they were the only Christians that the Muslims allowed in the Holy Land once they took it over. And, uh, and, and so this idea of a, a name that will never be effaced, Francis of Assisi has a name that will never be effaced and he never had children at all. He says, as for or, foreigners who attach themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the Lord's name and be his servants, all who observe the Sabbath, not profaning it, and hold fast to my covenant, these I shall lead to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. And so he's talking about these uh, foreigners. It would be like us who, who follow the tradition that we've received from the Jews, basically. And 
the idea is that he, he guarantees us a place in there. And what, what God is saying here is that um, Judaism is not blood, but Judaism is a way of life. And the same thing is Christianity. Christianity is not baptism. Christianity is a way of living. And you have people who, uh, the Karl Rahner, a great uh, theologian uh, from uh, the last century, actually. Um, but Karl Rahner used to use the term anonymous Christians. And he says an anonymous Christian is a person without baptism who is living the Christian life. He just called them anonymous Christians. And, 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 and this idea that they're, they're accepted that way. He said, the Lord God, no, he says, their burnt offerings and sacrifices on my altar will win my favor, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And again, we have lots of these things like this in the Jewish scriptures, but the Jews were really unprepared for the Gentiles entering. At the time of Jesus, it was, it was a, a terrible thing to get them to accept the fact of the Christians Gentiles coming in, even among the Christians, like we watched the conflict between Peter and Paul on that, that it was really, really difficult for them. He said, the Lord God who gathers the exile of exiles of Israel declares, there are others I shall gather to him besides those already gathered. So it's as though God is saying the traditional Jew, who's Jewish parents and everything, that's one group, but he has others he's going to gather to them. And Jesus will say the same thing in the New Testament. He talks about the Christian community and he says, others that I must gather to this thing. And this whole idea that God's, God created no person except to go to heaven. That was his intention in creating. Everyone was created to be in heaven and that's the intention of God's work. He says, Come and feast, all you wild beasts, all you beasts of the forest. And this is uh, sort of a condemnation of the, the leaders of Israel who are, um, who are not pointing out the dangers that are going on. You know, it's, uh, it, it, I don't know how to put it in, uh, if, if I build my life on the fact of my self-righteousness, it's important for me not to notice there's anything wrong with me. And as a result of that, we can blind ourselves to all kinds of things. And that's why I've mentioned before, one of the basic tenets of this fundamentalist Christianity is innocence. And in the Roman Catholic tradition, we don't believe innocence exists. You're born in sin. And then you, you, through baptism, the sin's removed. But there is no such thing as an innocent person, period. And, but if you hold to the thing of innocence, that's why you have people like, uh, well, I would use Jimmy Schweiger, where the, the double life he was leading is very secret, because you can't let anyone know that you have a problem with anything because it's innocence, you know, and, and fortunately we don't believe in innocence. So he's describing, they don't point out, he says, his watchmen are blind. They, none of them, know anything. Dumb watchdogs all, unable to bark. They dream lying down and are happy to sleep. Okay, and it's the idea that, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but traditionally in the castles, they had large watchdogs, like Rottweilers and that, uh, Dobermans and stuff like that. They were large, vicious dogs. But one of the things about large dogs is they like to sleep. And so, uh, when you, when you have large dogs, what they would always do is have small ones. Because the small ones would get very barky when another, anything came around. 
and that would wake the big dogs who could do their, do their job. Well, he's describing these in terms of the watchdogs who sleep, and they, they choose not to look at the problems and that sort of thing. And it, you know, it, one of the difficulties in the way our country is constructed is that there's a temptation <clears throat> on the part of a president not to see problems that are come to fruition in someone else's, uh, what do you call it, administration. So like for instance, you can spend all the money if he has to pay the debt. You can, you can do that, you know, this sort of thing. And so there's a temptation to do that. But it, it, it's important if a, if a person is, uh, well, in our, in our own lives, it's important to point out problems when they're small and can be dealt with. And you know that you, I, I think a, a parent who notices uh, children drinking, um, it's better to deal with that the younger you can, uh, or drugs or that sort of thing. But to be able to watch the dangers and sort of, sort of deal with them, and most importantly for ourselves, but it, it requires a real honesty that you have to be able to stand in front of a person and say, I am drinking too much. And then as soon as you say that, that actually gives you a freedom to do some things. And I, I think that um, in, uh, if you're a real friend, you know, a close friend will enforce the resolutions you make. So that if, if you make the resolutions, that they will help to do it. Like a, we had in uh, our Yezu Caritas group, the small group, we had, we had a priest one time who had a very serious alcoholic problem. And normally we would go out for dinner, have a couple of drinks, have our dinner and go home, that sort of thing. But you know, it's very interesting. Nothing was said by anyone, but the first night that we went out, that he was with us for dinner, no one ordered a drink. But no one said don't drink, it, it wasn't done. But it, it's this idea of, of you know, helping one another to deal with difficulties because I think anything can be dealt with by a group, but a lot of things cannot be dealt with alone. But anything can be dealt with by a group. He says, uh, the dogs have a mighty appetite, shepherds without understanding, each turn to their own way, to their own gain, one and all. And so he's, he's describing that these people are interested in their own good. And again, we've, one of the things we've talked about here a couple times is that to have authority is to realize it's for the benefit of the people you have authority over. Okay, that's the purpose of authority. Authority is, is to help you. I, I oftentimes think of that on a, uh, you know, a cruise ship. If you take the crew, that's, well, women and children first. They're there to make sure women and children get off first, okay? Uh, I think the, the, the great uh, thing with the whole deal of the Titanic was the very first lifeboat out the captain was in. And the, the thing is that he, what he said, uh, I, I think a lifeboat held 50 people and there were four of them in the lifeboat with him. And, but he maintained he was gonna go around the ship to see if something was wrong. If something was wrong, you know, but anyway, uh, he survived until a court case. He says, come, I'll get wine. Let us drink to the full. Tomorrow's like today, better than ever. And so he's describing these leaders who are thinking, well, it'll be the same tomorrow, it'll be the same tomorrow, it'll be the same tomorrow. And ignorant of, you know, things that are, are sitting in. I've, I see that right now that uh, if you've been watching the news about weather internationally, that, you know, I. So many years we were getting warnings telling us what would happen and all this sort of thing. And well, you know, it'll, and it ended up taking half the time that everyone thought it would take. But 
It's the problem anyway. He says, the righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. The gentle are carried off and no one is concerned. So these leaders are not concerned with the problems that are happening to the weaker people in society. And so people who build their lives on righteousness and, and uh, gentleness, uh, they take advantage of them and they, they, they abuse them and this sort of thing. It says, it was because of evil that the righteous were carried off. And then he gives this uh, judgment against the people. He says, such a one uh, will enter peace and those who follow the straight way will find repose in their resting place. So irrespective of the problems they go through, they ultimately will come to reward. Salvation is what we would call it, okay? He says, but you, you children of a witch, come here, offspring of an adulterer and prostitute, okay? So this is a, a section where they're going through a denunciation of uh, what I will call sexual license, okay? That they're, they're denouncing it. And he first of all condemns them as being children of a witch, uh, offering of an adulterer or, or a prostitute. And understand that a lot of sexual practices were connected with pagan religions. And so that's why they use the thing of witch. The, the, they had witches, uh, oracles and stuff in the pagan religions. So he's really connecting it with this, this pagan religion. He says, whom are you mark, mocking? At whom are you making faces and sticking out your tongue? Are you not the children of rebellion, a deceitful race? And what, what he's talking about here is that the things they're engaging in are moving them away from their religious roots. And so while they, um, they would go into, uh, what do you want to call it? Um, they go into sexual practices for gratification and for pleasure. The side of it is that it makes them less interested in the other problems that need to be dealt with. And there's a, a potpourri of problems that flow from sexual license. And, and that begins to prey on the society itself. Like, for instance, adultery. If you, if you just take a simple thing like adultery, adultery is the biggest single danger to marriage. And the result of divorce often is children raised without one parent. And oftentimes children are raised with no parent because if you have one parent, that parent has to work to support you. So you end up, you know, without the, the guidance of parents. It was interesting to me in, uh, in uh, grade school, the type of trouble that kids were getting into because they were like what we call lock key kids. The, there were no parents at home ever. They couldn't, they couldn't afford to it really. So he says, uh, lusting among the oak trees and under every leafy tree, sacrificing children in the ravines, below the clefts in the rocks. So lusting among the oak trees, the, the um, what do you want to call it? The sexual practices connected with the pagan religions are all connected to nature because that's a part of nature religions. So they're all connected to nature. And uh, like, you know what the crocus is, uh, a flower? And you used to plant the crocus at your house. And if, when the crocus bloomed, then you could be uh, involved in the spring rites that were all these sexual things. But the blooming of your crocus was God's invitation to you to be involved in the thing. It was good to live on the sunny side of the street, you know. But the, when the crocus bloomed, then that was it. But things were, were, were done that way. And so they, they describe, it, describe it under the oak trees and leafy trees. They're, 
they were all different plants and everything connected with this stuff, and animals as well. And he said, sacrificing children in the ravines. Uh, if you visit Israel today, the, uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem sits on a point and a river comes down. I don't even know what the river is. And it splits and it splits into the Kidron Valley and the Valley of Gehenna. And the Kidron Valley, uh, you go through the Kidron Valley, you go up to the Mount of Olives, and on top is the Mount where the Ascension took place, just over its Bethany. On the other side, there are soccer fields in there. And then on the other side of that, then there's the modern city of Jerusalem is there. But nothing has ever been built there. And that is where the pagans used to sacrifice children. And they had a huge furnace thing for, uh, I think the god's name was Moloch, and they would throw the children in. And they, uh, they would sacrifice their firstborn child. And it would, the child would, so you're safe. But they would sacrifice the firstborn child and, uh, and then uh, apparently be blessed by God. But the, that's what they end up involved in. And in fact, if you, if you look at, um, at the story of uh, the Jews leaving Egypt, there's a real question as to whether or not the uh, Egyptians, as part of their religion, would kill their firstborn child, because that was a very common thing. So it wasn't that God killed the firstborn of all the thing, it's that the Jews who left that system None of theirs were killed because they left that system. Anyway, it says the stu smooth stones of the wadis will be your portion and they shall be your lot. Uh, a wadi is an arroyo and they are places where water flows at certain times of the year and so the rocks are all rounded like you find in the bottom of a river, okay? And, and worthless and they're your portion. To these you have poured libations and have brought your grain offering. And what happens is, I'm sure um, most of us have had this experience, but if you, uh, if, if you go to a, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, go to a river with rocks, in, you periodically see very beautiful rocks. And that's because uh, Rocks that are turned in the sand are literally polished by the sand, and the water will tell you how they look polished. When, when you polish stones, the first thing you do is lick your finger and rub the liquid on the stone. It'll tell you what it'll look like when it's polished, because that's what the polish does, you know, much like wax on a floor. And so, uh, so these stones would be picked up and worshipped, you know, because they were beautiful or whatever. He says, and then God says, for this, I should show mercy, okay? He said, on high and lofty mountains, you've set your bed. There you too have gone up to offer your sacrifice, okay? Now that's a refer to the sexual thing again. And uh, I, again, I've, I've mentioned this here, but if it was the feast of a female god or a goddess, a goddess rather, um, you would go into the temple and a female goddess would have priestesses, and you'd have sexual relations with the priestess, whether you were a man or a woman. And then that was the, uh, the way of worshiping the god. And on the feast of uh, a, a, a male god, there are priests there. And then you would go and have sexual relations with the priest, whether you're a man or a woman, and that was worshiping that god. And in, if I were to go to Rome, I would say like if you were to go into the temple of Astarte or of Venus, it would be a man. If you would go into the temple of Jupiter or Mars, it would be a woman. It would, you know, it was just dependent. And their whole year was set up with feasts to these people one way or another. He says, behind the door and doorpost, you have fixed your sign. Deserting me, you exposed yourself, climbed onto your bed and made, made room on it. Okay, and so this idea of uh, behind the door and the doorpost, you fixed your signs. There, there were symbols and signs 
that invited people to be involved in the sexual thing. Sort of a, I'm, I'm thinking of the thing like uh, if if the you know the roommates, the, uh, two two guys, will hang a sock on the door if he's got a girlfriend in there, so the other guy doesn't come in on them, take pictures and put them on the internet. I mean, does not come in? And, so the uh, but but this idea they would have signs like that. He says, you struck a deal with those whose bed you love. You gazed on their nakedness. You went to Meloch with oil. You lavished your perfumes and sent your messengers far afield and went down to Sheol itself. And so this idea that the things that were involved in worship, besides the sexual things, were valuable things. So like you'd get frankincense, you'd get myrrh, you get these olive oil, you get all these different things that we, I think guess we would kind of connect them with a massage or something like that, you have know, all these kinds of things. And he said, you went down to Sheol itself. Sheol is basically death, so that you basically, uh, that, that will be, take you to your end. Though tired by so many travels, you never gave up. Finding your vigor renewed, you never slackened. And one of the things that's really fascinating about this stuff, it says, though tired by so many travels, it's, it's because of the weight of doing evil. And I, I give you an example. If you were to take a, uh, well, I, I'll give you an example of my mother. My mother uh, was a smoker all along. And uh, at one point, she had a small lump on her breast and went into the hospital to have it, uh, what do you call it, uh, biopsied. So, and she went in the hospital, and the doctor told me before she went in, he said that there is not a ghost of a chance that that is cancerous. And the reason is, he says, I've seen lots of those, that is not cancerous. But he says, we have to biopsy it and this sort of thing, and I'm not telling your mother anything because I'm hoping this scares her out of smoking. And then the doctor called me in after the surgery was over and everything. He said, and you know, if it was cancerous, they'd have removed the breast as well. they just go through the whole thing. But the doctor called me in and he said, it didn't do any good at all. Your mother asked for a cigarette before she asked if her breast had been removed. So, and it's just, and, and you watch alcoholics, you know, they lose their job, they lose their spouse, their children won't talk to them, they're homeless, they're and they're drinking. They just, know. there's something about this that, that, that uh, I believe personally that sin is its own punishment and that God tries to get us not to sin because he doesn't want us to be subject to the penalty of sin, okay? And the, and uh, just a thing about my mother with regards to thing. My mother uh, never would have seen uh, smoking as sinful. I don't think that, that was understood that way at all. But if it does that kind of harm to your body, it is sinful. So he says, who was it you dreaded and feared that you should cheat on me, no longer remember me, nor take me to heart? And it's almost like God saying, to whom would you go if you're turned away from me? You know, like, like who's going to save you? Who's going to give you everlasting life? Who's going to, wh where are you going? You know, what, what, what is the deal? And he says, was it my long silence that spared you from fearing me? And God's saying that, is it because I didn't punish you? that you stop fearing me? That, you know, that um, sometimes you, you look at a person's life and that you realize that the, in, in going through their life, they've never quite come to grips with their sinfulness. And you see them going on, you know, a very long life. And in fact, it's God giving them more and more opportunities to repent because God's interested in their repentance not their punishment, that sort of thing. He says, now I shall myself make known your righteousness and all your doings. They will profit you nothing. 
So the path you've taken, the things you've followed, he says, that ultimately will destroy you. It gives you nothing. When you cry for help, let your escorts save you, okay? And it, the escort means the same thing it would here, hired uh, sexual partner. He says, let, let them see if they can save you. The wind will carry them all off. One puff, they'll be dispersed. But the one who takes refuge in me will inherit the land and will possess my holy mountain. So he calls people to himself because there's no alternative and then points out what happens to people who rely on these other things. And I, I, I think it's really, you know, uh, I, I think particularly when I, I go back to high school and college, but actually I noticed it in high school, there are a lot of uh, uh, classmates of mine who got drunk every night in, in high school and then in college and uh, ended up, you know, alcoholics their whole life. But the fact of the matter is that um, if you get really seriously drunk in high school, you can get up and go to classes the next morning. But that same drunk at the age of 50, you can't get up, physically cannot get up. And what happens is that it takes a worse toll every day. And one of the things, I'll give you an example. An example is called walking pneumonia. Walking pneumonia is a very serious disease and many people die of it. And the reason is, it is a very slow pneumonia and you don't feel that much worse today than you did yesterday. So you don't realize it's getting bad, but your lungs are very slowly filling with liquid and you're getting less and less oxygen and you feel a little worse each day, but just a little. It's not like you have an accident and suddenly your leg's broken or something. And so these people most often die unless you know they have recognition. I think I told you one time I had a, a woman come to me, her husband had what she thought was a cold and she couldn't get him to go to the doctor and he'd had the cold about a month. And so uh, she said, will you talk to him? I said, sure. So he came in, he sat down, we spoke just about three or four words and I left the room and I came back. And when I came back, I said to him, um, I've phoned an ambulance. And I said, you have walking pneumonia. And when he spoke, you could hear the gurgling. And that, that's one of the sure signs of it. But anyway, the, the idea is that, that sin works that way. If you could take from before you started the sin and take to this point, you'd realize how much happier you were then but it just takes little increments and you don't realize how miserable a person gets until finally a life is so bad people will choose to end it. So why don't, speaking of ending it, why don't we stop here and we'll pick it up at 5714.